Welcome to Historic New England's new streaming series, Leading Voices, Conversations on Preservation, Resilience, and Cultural Philanthropy. I'm Vin Cipolla, President and CEO of Historic New England, the nation's oldest and largest regional heritage organization and a leader in historic preservation and storytelling. Our Leading Voices series hosts cultural and philanthropic leaders from the U.S. and abroad discussing the critical catalytic role of private philanthropy in building, protecting, and ensuring our cultural fabric. Today's program features two distinguished leaders in the cultural world, Elizabeth Diller and Susan Whiting, who will be discussing the opportunities and challenges of building successful, accessible cultural projects. Liz Diller, a co-founding partner of Diller, Scofidio, and Renfro, has designed some of the world's most acclaimed, innovative buildings and spaces, projects that have reshaped our current cultural landscape. It would take too long to list all of DSR's work, but let me name just a few. The adaptive reuse of an obsolete railway that became New York's High Line, the transformation of Lincoln Center's campus, the latest expansion of MoMA, the Broad Art Center Museum, and the ICA Boston. Among her many honors, Liz, alongside Rick Scofidio, was included on Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People list and received the first Genius Grant awarded in the field of architecture from the MacArthur Foundation. Susan Whiting is chair of the board of the National Women's History Museum and leads the museum's evolution. An expert in consumer behavior, audience management, and media research, she most recently served as vice chair of Nielsen, the world's largest research company. In addition to her work with the museum, Susan has had decades of experience as a volunteer leader and board member for organizations including the Trust for Public Land and Denison University. She is also involved in mentoring female business leaders around the world. It is my great pleasure to introduce Liz Diller and Susan Whiting. Thank you, Vin, for that introduction. And thank you to Historic New England for inviting us, uh, Liz Diller and me, to have a conversation today. Really excited about it and um, excited to hear from her on topics that I think we should share a common interest in. I know we haven't met in person, but it's terrific to be here uh, for this this talk we're doing together. And um, I think you know, but maybe not. I chair the National Women's History Museum, and we we are the leading museum without walls, virtual museum for women's history in the United States, and uh, about to take the first leap into our physical presence to add that to the virtual and just have just learned that our next step is going to be within the Martin Luther King Library in Washington, D.C., which is the Mies van der Rohe building that's just been restored. But we're going in with our exhibit plans and our programming plans, but haven't uh, designed the space um, really are starting from scratch, you know, and nobody's been able to go into any of these buildings. And so, you know, given all your incredible experience, if you um, were advising us of the things to be thinking about in planning space that needs to be accessible and interesting, do you, could you give me some advice? <laughs> That's where I would start. Well, okay. It's a, it's a big question. So, um, I suppose first would be to think about the program and um, what kind of um, exhibitions you're going to have and what kinds of programs you're going to have besides uh, exhibition space um, and the quantities of visitors that you will expect, the diversity of them, children, for example, children and um, the, um, just to understand the first, very basically the space needs. Um, and then secondly, the attributes of the space, um, mm -hmm. and how it correlates actually to the content that you intend to, to show. So one of the things that's so exciting to that point, um, about the space is it's very transparent mm -hmm. and open and, um, a lot of what you know, we think is exciting about what we're doing, which is very focused on education. So children will pay, play a large part in this, but so do adults, is just the opportunity to open up the stories about history that haven't been told about women's contributions. And so 
um, I think that ties a lot to what I've read about your work as well in thinking about, um, you know, accessibility and the change of spaces from physical buildings to so much more than that. I'm really curious about how that's evolved um, in your practice, because you're so well known for that. <laughs> Well, uh, very often architects, and, and I would say it's the typical condition where architects um, receive a brief um, that's been conceived and written by um, a client, an institution, um, that's often based on um, something that's inherited from uh, by them. Some a, a list of maybe conventions, but not always inventions um, that are... Uh, sometimes necessary for a project, um, and in so some of our work um, does uh, fall into that category where we receive a brief, we understand um, uh, the potential of a space, either an existing structure or a piece of property um, and its context, and then we try to unravel everything, and um, and very often we just don't take anything as assumed, even with a brief, we want to sort of kick it around, we want to test it, we come in as kind of uh, uh, more critical um, agents in a way and help to finesse and help to find um, um, whether it's simply um, a sort of confirmation of everything that we learned from the brief or a slight translation or a broader translation of it. Um, occasionally, we get to write those briefs ourselves from scratch. And it doesn't happen very often, but um, uh, in the making of a new institution, let's say, like a new museum like that you're going to be uh, doing, that um, how do you know what's in there and what's not? How do you even start the conversation? And, um, and so it takes um, a lot of creative thought and a lot of research to get to a point where you can write a brief and then you can um, test it um, with experts in the field and you know hone it and hone it. And once you have it, then an architect could translate it, that into physical space. Occasionally, the physical space and the brief are interdependent and they can't be, one doesn't follow another. So it happens in all different forms. Um, but I think that that's really the exciting thing about uh, architecture is that it's not just simply following a set of rules. It's, it's challenging them, rewriting them, um, and being part of the whole institution-making process. And do you think, you know, my experience has been in this and some other um, work that I've done, not-for-profit work, is you know, engaging donors, either being a donor <laughs> or engaging donors at different stages in large projects um, has really different impact on those projects. I mean, what, what would you think, I mean, how would you most easily think you would get major donors engaged? Is it at the very beginning, at the conception? Is it when you have an idea that's already somewhat formed or does it depend? Oh, that uh, so I've been on the fundraising um, side as well, very, very often on projects. And um, uh, it's most successful if um, it happens at the beginning. And um, but but donors don't respond just to um, words on paper. Donors often respond to a vision, right? The vision could be written, but it could also be, demonstrated somehow uh, visually. And, and uh, very often in my experience, um, there is something like a visioning phase, you know, in which there's both a program that's conceived and also uh, a kind of corresponding set of visual material that could be shared. Um, that, that's the beginning of imagining what it could be like and feel like. Um, I, I, I think that donors, um, really respond to something that's tangible, you know, rather than just like, let's say, a name or, or a, a mission statement um, or even a broad um, explanation of program. It's, um, 
you know, it, 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 I, I can't really make rules about this. So it's, you know, it may be different for your project, um, but, and because, because uh, you know, uh, I, I think your project is very special because anyone would want to get involved in that, you know, not, it's not always that, uh, that a, a new institution, like for example, my history at the shed, which was a, a new institution, nobody understood what it was. So how could you raise money and how could you make a case that this is necessary um, and important, um, you know, uh, and, and therefore, you know, have um, folks uh, understand that, you know, that it's, it's, only, it's like a sense of shared responsibility to make it happen. So the urgency of something and the need is very, very important to express. And um, on, on the shed, which is new institution, institution, very very hard um, to have people understand why it's necessary. Um, we had to try extra hard, and we needed a tremendous amount of visual information and explanation and contextualization um, to to actually sell it. Mm -hmm. That well, I'm I'm thinking of just this moment in time and the. You know what we've all learned and are still learning about the pandemic and um you know how how that timing matters um something totally different that i'm on the board of denison university because i have a passion for education and we've been thinking about and conceptualizing the idea of a wellness center you know as a as a holistic wellness on a campus and then it sort of the project got pushed pushed back a little bit and a little bit and a little bit but of course, now <laughs> it seems um, so incredibly important. But but in this case, I think many of the donors and parents, often parents of students um, or past students, but alums and trustees as well of the university, saw a need, and it wasn't so much about the physical um, building. That became a very exciting opportunity to build something that that made you feel you were in a wellness space in addition to both the medical and the other things that you could bring together but what struck me is that um the idea was so strong and the need was seen so that the building actually was allowed to be created in a way that that fit the moment in time, which actually, because of everything that had happened and the fact that we were waiting a bit, I think has turned out to be much better <laughs> than it would have been conceptualized before, which is one of those unusual things where putting something off sometimes actually <laughs> makes it better. I don't know. How, yeah. how has the pandemic affected, you know, your thinking or the projects you're working on? Well, it, it's interesting. The, um, you know, it, it will definitely change um, the way we work and the way um, philanthropy works. And most of our work is uh, for cultural institutions and or um, educational institutions. And, and that's sort of what we've, um, we've been doing. And, and the, the concern is that um, it, while education will never be forgotten and it's always uh, a priority, culture may not be as much of a priority. And it, it's a huge concern of ours because we think it's, it's as important for people's minds and souls and, uh, and, uh, and the preservation of culture and, and initiating new uh, work in the arts. Um, so I, I do worry that priorities might be shifting and that certain things might be left behind. But you know, when I think about the shed, and the shed is you know one of the um, you know strongest examples of uh, my experience with philanthropy, was we started that project in 2008, and it was kind of the height of the recession, yeah, and right? and uh, and it was so <laughs> unlikely that anyone would contribute, anyone would even care about building a new cultural mm -hmm. institution. Um, no one really knew, you know, how much they were worth anymore, you know, and um, because of the uncertainty of, of the economy at that time, it was very unstable. And um, so we were, you know, in our kind of exuberant naivete, we proposed this project. Um, and 
um, you know, however unlikely it was, it, it's here, it's with us now, what got built is, is uh, you know, there's a board uh, mm -hmm. and an artistic director, and if not for COVID, it would have been two years old now. Um, uh, but it, it is two years old, but it just didn't have programming in the last year. But um, what was um, so interesting is that, you know, perhaps times of uncertainty, I'm also thinking about back when we did the Highline and Lincoln Center, those were two projects um, that um, got kicked off in about 2003, um, 2003, 2004. And, um, and there, there's something that um, um, I think was very, very palpable in the era. There was a kind of sense of need um, post 9-11 to do some really large and important projects in New York. Mm -hmm. And no one really talked about it that way, but I think that there was a kind of feeling about this um, need and urgency to reestablish New York and to rethink some of our public spaces and um, to, to sort of, you know, make these gifts to the city. And, um, and I think once they opened, there were m m surprises. Both of those proje projects were surprises because they were never highly advertised during the process of um, creation, fundraising, uh, selling to the city. But then when they opened, everyone was uh, super, super happy. But when I look back on that, it was at a time of crisis mm -hmm. that um, it, it happened. And so, I, you know, I think that there is a, <clears throat> really interesting alignment, um, which is unexpected. You'd think that uh, um, that that uh, uh, folks that really are that have that that uh, ability to give would you know would be more um, you know possessive and would not be generous at those times. But uh, it's just the contrary. I th I think that. Um... That's a really great point, and timing does, you know, the timing does matter, but there, it may be that it, the perspectives people have about what's important <laughs> are, yeah. um, are just highlighted in ways you didn't anticipate. Um, and I think about um, space and um, community and um, the focus that we've had on needing outdoor space in this moment in time and the need and role parks play, for example, um, and can play in health, um, which I don't think, I hope no one will ever take for granted again. <laughs> but um, it sounds like from the reading I was doing about your work and um, one of my other passions, which is the Trust for Public Land, where we work very much about parks and space um, and access to space. Um, but so much of it is based upon engaging a community and the design and the work and i just curious to your experience in in that aspect and how it affects philanthropy and fundraising yeah um well a public space is a key to a strong city um and uh i I live in a real estate oriented city, uh, New York, and every square inch is worth a lot and it's traded and, uh, and, uh, uh, and it c continues to escalate in meaning. And sometimes it's not used and just stored uh, with, with its uh, uh, value increasing. And uh, this is a kind of uh, concern of, of mine, my studios is the privatization of uh, property and um, the sort of lack of future um, locations for public space. And so if we imagine, and this is um, COVID, um, it, without even thinking about, you know, what COVID is going to do to the density of cities, we've always felt, you know, in this, at least the uh, second half of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, density is good. That density mm -hmm. makes That's good right. cities, and you know the vibrancy and programming, and um, and uh, uh, everyone being together. Um, and this is uh, it's it's um, as we think about a post-COVID uh, uh, city. I hope that the effects of 
COVID and social distancing don't, you know, don't have long-term effects on keeping people away. In any case, its effect on um, architecture is, is something that I continue to think about. But parks, coming back to your question about parks and public space, um, it is, um, it's, it's as important as the air that we breathe. You know, we need public spaces. We need green space. We need parks to make cities work. And, um, and architects have to advocate for that, as do citizens. Um, otherwise, you know, all of our spaces are going to be um, used uh, for real estate development. But in the case of the High Line, um, there was a need for green space in Chelsea, in that area, meatpacking district of New York. There, there was a deficit of green space. Um, but the argument was on what the High Line will do as a catalyst for urban growth. And that really worked with the city. The city understood that, oh, this was a, an area that was rather depressed. Uh, Meatpacking has already left. Well, I it was remember. No, remember, I mean, yeah. some of us thought it was kind of cool. You know, it was, it was definitely sketchy. But, um, but then uh, the, the friends of the High Line, the, the, uh, the two young citizen activists that actually did most of the heavy lifting to make it happen, um, you know, they, they argued um, on the basis of uh, that, that this is going to have an effect, kind of like Central Park and Frederick Law Olmsted um, uh, argued for the growth of Manhattan northward around Central Park. And this is that, that the High Line could actually be um, a, catal a catalyst for urban growth. Um, I don't think anyone expected the amount and the speed of growth that happened, you know, which is makes us all think again about, you know, how we would have done it differently um, or would we have. Um, but the um, it, it's not always obvious that city, city leadership understands the importance of a park for its social and health benefits. But they do understand the economic benefits. And, and we have to use whatever leverage we can find to do the right thing in the end, you know? And in the end, what's good for, you know, one group is also good for another. And that's part of our work, I think, as architects is to, um, is hopefully to find the right voice to speak in, you know, I speak in different tongues depending on who I'm speaking to, but with this very same message that this, this is an important thing. It's important for you too. Uh, and it, it, it reminds me of um, a, a lecture that I gave it, uh, on our work at Lincoln Center, and it was called Lincoln, Lincoln Center Six Ways. And it was basically the exact same presentation of 15 slides with the exact same message, but told slightly differently to an audience of community, to an audience of historic preservationists, to the client group, to the city officials, um, to an academic audience, to reporters, and 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 and, but it's exactly the same message. Message. Uh, it's it's well with you know emphasis with a different emphasis here and there, but it's the same um, sort of uh, uh, the, the character of what I'm saying is largely the same, but it's it's just a, a matter of of emphasis here and there where people understand. And if you're doing something good, they'll 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 understand that it's also good for them. Mm -hmm. and, and it's up to us all, you know, you uh, putting a new institution together, you know, to um, show the benefits, to express the benefits for everyone, not only women, but everyone, um, yeah. to have a, a, a museum that recognizes women's history. Well, particularly for women's history, you know, our goal is that men and women <laughs> yeah. and boys and girls and everyone understands the impact because the change that's possible from understanding that really has to be clear to everybody. Um, but you remind me of a project uh, the Trust for Public Land did, the 606 Trail in oh, Chicago. Yeah. And I was, I love that project, but it had very, in, in its own Chicago way, <laughs> some very similar history. Um, it took a long time to get the support to build, but it made a very, very big impact that that some people have argued was too successful uh, in changing the communities around it. But um, in all these projects, finding a way to represent 
you know, the need for whatever it is we're doing um, and understand that there are different stakeholders and different people who, who have a voice and an opinion who you have to be looking at, whether it's, you know, the people who will visit and the people who will be the donors and the community leaders and the educators or whomever it is, um, I think is really important. And, and I have found that how you approach that, um, to your point, is more about the interest people have and less about the gender. Um, but I, I wonder if there are projects where, or, or initiatives where you think broadly women approach some of the questions or the topics or the projects differently than, than your experience with, with men as donors. Are you, have you seen that? Can you think of that? Mm. It's, you know, I, I'm not sure I could distinguish so much. Um, you know, very often in the, uh, when I think about the donors uh, that have uh, made a difference in my life, you know, and in the institutions that I've been involved with, very often they're couples. Um, and very often, <laughs> um, maybe the uh, female in the group, uh, if it's a male, female, it's the, it's the woman that's pushing for the public good. You know, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to give you an example. Um, and this is an odd example. It's the, the, Broad, the, uh, the Broad Project, which is a museum we did in Los Angeles. And it's for um, a private um, philanthropic family, uh, the Broads, that have this extensive art, co art collection, post-war and contemporary. Eli just passed away um, two weeks ago. But um, uh, Edie, who is never ever mentioned in the discussions and the press and all that, was so far, was, was in, uh, you know, like the cheerleader of the project and, um, and organized Eli's um, uh, thoughts and helped him to make decisions. And, and so very often, um, you know, and, and many of the philanthropic families um, are, there are different generations, you know, of course, that's going to make a big difference, you know. So in the generation of the 70 and 80 year olds, it's more dominated by men and women are usually in a role that's very, very important, but not very recognized. In, in uh, latter generations, it's, I see it as uh, more of an equal conversation. Thank you, uh, Historic New England, for giving us this opportunity to meet virtually and also to, to have a wonderful conversation, which I think could go on for hours. Um, really, really appreciate it. And the opportunity to actually give me the reason to stand back and think about some of these topics that we were talking about today. Um, because while you're in the middle of it, sometimes you don't see the big themes and just the idea of the importance of of philanthropy and the development of cultural institutions and all of the impacts those can have. Um, really, really important to me personally and a great opportunity to talk with people who have the same beliefs. So thank you. And Susan, thank you um, for having this conversation with me and for your interesting questions and it makes me really think deep about um, how important it is when you uh, initiate and conceive of a new institution that you also design the process by which it's c conceived, right? So brilliant and important idea, but as important as the architecture ultimately is, the process to get you there is as much of a design problem that involves expertise from so many different people and, um, and the uh, philanthropist, the graciousness of philanthropists, and how fortunate we are actually in the U.S. to have a culture of philanthropy at all, yes. where it's really unmatched anywhere in the world. So we're very lucky that we can make new institutions. Um, and, you know, good luck to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Liz and Susan, thank you so much for sharing your particular experiences and insights on some of our most important cultural projects. To find out more about our guests today 
as well as about leading voices in historic New England's heritage work, please visit historicnewengland.org slash leading voices. On behalf of Historic New England, I'm Vince Cipolla. Thanks for joining us.